When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass-fed and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. I think a lot of times we expect that, you know, maybe if someone is widowed, they might be going from a a two income home to a one income home or a one income home to a no income home. And they might be faced with the challenges of less money than they're used to. But what I find that we're not discussing and we need to discuss is what happens when actually as a widow, you end up with more money than you've ever had before. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Come to Game, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. Welcome, my friend. It is so good to have you here. I want to just take a minute and really thank you for being a loyal listener. I don't do this enough, but it's because of you that this show keeps going. So listen, if you are a fan and haven't done so already, I'd really be honored if you could leave the show a review in Apple Podcasts. It is one of the best ways that we can help continue to grow the show. Now, this episode title might have scared you a bit, and that's certainly not my intention. This idea of wealth purgatory, it's a term when a widowed spouse is left with money and they just don't know what to do with it. No matter what your age is, if you have a partner, this is a good episode to really Let's sink in and open the doors to communication. Krista is a master certified life coach, grief expert, widow, mom, and host of the Widow Mom podcast. When her husband was tragically killed by a drunk driver in 2016, Krista's life was completely and unexpectedly flipped upside down, as you can imagine. She is sharing the money lessons she learned during this process and how she would have done things differently long before the accident. I'm Shauna Compton-Game, this is Millennial Money, and this is a very, very important episode that I'm thrilled to bring to you. 
Krista, I am so, so happy to have you on the show today. How is your day going? Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. It's going well as my daughter, who's now a senior, her first last day of high school. So we are wow. off to a good start first, around here. I first know. last day. I love that. I <laughs> yeah. You couldn't pay me to go back and do high school over again. So, oh my um, gosh. Especially in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, I can't. I can't imagine. And I didn't go to high school with all this technology. Mm -hmm. So I think it was maybe I mean, high school is hard, no matter how you slice it. But I think with all the technology and and apps and whatnot, it just is probably a little bit more difficult. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Well, this episode is about a topic we haven't covered a lot on the show, but it's it's obviously one that's really important. This idea of what we're calling wealth purgatory. So not to not to sound dramatic, but in real life being widowed can happen, can happen to any of us, and it can have a really big impact on your finances. So before we jump into really sharing your story, uh, tell us a little bit more about what what is this wealth purgatory? What does this really mean? Yeah. So, you know, of course I coach widowed moms and we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, all the common struggles. And of course money comes up and wealth purgatory is this, you know, surprising state that most widows don't expect themselves to be in. I think a lot of times we expect that, you know, maybe if someone is widowed, they might be going from a a two income home to a one income home or a one income home to a no income home. And they might be faced with the challenges of less money than they're used to. But what I find that we're not discussing and we need to discuss is what happens when actually as a widow, you end up with more money than you've ever had Mm, before. Interesting. Right. But you aren't happy with that money, right? You're having a miserable experience of that money. You're in what I call wealth purgatory. So you don't know what to do with it. You're not confident about it. You're worried you're going to lose it, waste it. It's not going to last. You're embarrassed, ashamed that you have it. There's a lot of emotion attached to that money. It's just a general miserable miserable experience, (laughs) right? With all of this money that if you hadn't known better, you would have thought would solve all your problems. And yeah, I think that's that's so interesting because human nature, we just tend to think that more money is going to solve all of our problems, that right. suddenly we're going to be happy, everything's going to be fantastic, we're going to be skipping down the street. And certainly in a situation about being widowed, we tend to just think, well, more money is just, I mean, how could that possibly be a problem? But I think what you're talking about really goes back even further if we dig down to the foundation of it, which is that most of us just don't know what to do with money anyway. We're never taught about this. We don't talk about it. And so when we're in a situation like this, it's really amplified. Exactly. Yeah. And then because we don't want to talk about it, and maybe sometimes because we're not even happy that we have it, then we isolate. And so instead of reaching out and getting support from, you know, trusted advisors or friends, then we kind of put that on ourselves. And then now we're dealing with it all alone and it's getting worse instead of better. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously no one ever expects that they will become a widow. Uh, But if we're looking at this maybe from a proactive side, how can we, or are there ways, I maybe better said that way, are there ways to set ourselves up financially to prepare for anything that might come our way? Well, yeah, definitely, right? I mean, I've worked with so many widows who who didn't have any sort of financial discussions with their partners ahead of time, literally no planning. So for sure, we want to have those discussions in advance. And and sometimes it can be hard because maybe if you hadn't had that discussion and then you're up against a diagnosis or, you know, something that looks perhaps terminal, sometimes we shy away from having those discussions because we think that having that discussion, you know, will seal the deal or, um, you know, is somehow a bad idea. And so we're clinging to hope and and we can understand why we would do that, right? But then it it can prevent really important discussions from being had. So I think first and foremost, we just want to plan ahead in the relationship and have those discussions. What is our life insurance policy like? Do we have the passwords to our partners, you know, Mm, financial things? Do we know where they are? Do you know how to get into your partner's computer or phone? You know, if they're the ones managing the finances, we need to share that information together. Um, And so I see those pitfalls all the time 
And then on top of that, if you don't have a trusted advisor outside of your partnership, you know, I encourage people to get one because it's, it's so entertaining to me in, in, in a painful way when after you lose a spouse, everyone tells you you shouldn't make big decisions. Right. <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing ever. You don't have a choice. To, to not make big decisions, right? They're in front of you. People are asking you to make big decisions. You have to. So if if you're the person that you once went to, you know, was your your spouse or your partner, and that's who your your decision making partner was uh, as it relates to finances, who who's in your corner now? Who can you trust? Because you know your whole life gets turned upside down. It's hard to think straight. And if you don't have that person, it's hard to know who to trust. So get them now, right? Get that financial advisor now. That's such good advice. Uh, Oftentimes, because I handle the finances in um, our marriage, I often do a like fire drill with my husband, Mm. which he hates. But I'm like, all right, so like right now I'm not here. You have to you have to do this and pay this and and log into this. Like, how are you going to do this? Brilliant. And uh, he's always, you know, like, why are you making me do this? And I'm like, because I know that stuff happens in life. And I know that it's really hard to make decisions when you're when you're in a situation like that, you just can't think straight. So some of it almost has to be like somewhat automatic that you're like, okay, all right. I, I know at least how to cover the foundation and get that stuff taken care of. And then who to, like you said, the advisors, like who to reach out to to fill in the blanks. Yeah. And I think it's not even enough just to have passwords and understand where accounts are, you know, because a lot of us have two factor authentication set up. If you don't have your partner's phone, if you don't know how to get into, you know, any sort of extra layer of security, which is great to have, but if you don't know how to access it, it's going to cause you a problem. So it's not just knowing where things are and what the basic passwords are. It's being all the way able to log into everything in their absence. Right. Yes. Yes. We are definitely advocating being able to get into your partner's Mm -hmm. cell phone. (laughs) Yes. This is very important people. Yes. Um, So I, I, I think the story would be better told by you. You obviously come into this because you are a widow yourself. So Tell us about about 2016 and when your life was flipped upside down. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. It was flipped upside down. So I was happily married to, it was my second marriage, kind of man of my dreams. And we had been on a trip together and we'd driven separately. It was a volunteer trip that we'd been on and we were coming back from that trip and I had a flat tire and we pulled over to the side of the interstate and, you know, he was fully capable of changing a tire and just didn't want to wait on AAA to show up. So he started changing the tire or trying to get access to the tire in my trunk. And as he was doing that, even though we were way off to the side of the road and we had our hazard lights on, someone who we later found out had meth and alcohol in his system just crashed right into the back of Hugo's car. And, you know, that trapped him between Mm -hmm. his car and mine. And a day later he was gone. Right. So it was just something I, I never saw coming. Not that it's any easier when you do see it coming, you know, but for me, it was just here and gone. And, you know, there we go. So. Wow. It's just, um, it's hard to imagine even hearing a story. It's hard to imagine that actually happening in your life and then the ripple effect and the impact that that has. So I I would imagine that changed things in dramatic ways, but, but how did that then alter alter your life? Oh, in, in every way possible. I think when you lose a partner, it's really hard to anticipate the impact of that across the various areas of your life until it actually happens. But right, so many things are impacted. We work together, you know, mm-hmm. so even going to work was c- completely different, right? Because we had worked together. Um, you know, your your vision for the future is now totally not what you thought it would be. Sometimes your confidence, you didn't realize how much of your confidence you were leveraging, you know, from your spouse or your partner. And you've got to rebuild that. You've got to really figure out, okay, who am I without this person? Um, because I just haven't really had that. And yeah, it was a, it was, I'm not going to lie. It was miserable, right? It was a miserable period of life. And thank goodness for an amazing therapist who helped me 
you know, tell the story and talk about it and process the trauma and get back on my feet and get back to work. And then thank goodness for life coaching because, you know, life coaching really helped me not just settle for what, you know, you hear, well, you're going to get used to your new normal. And what a lot of widows hear when they hear that phrase new normal is <laughs> resign yourself to the future you don't really want, but think that's, you know, that's all that's possible for you. Mm. And so fortunately I found someone who could help me, right? Figure out that no post-traumatic growth is real. We don't actually have to just resign ourselves to a life that we don't want. We really can use any life experience and decide who we want to be, even though it happened and and still create a life that we love. So, you know, I got yeah, back on me, track. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about this idea of post-traumatic growth, because I think even if somebody listening here has not obviously experienced what you have, but maybe, I mean, we've all lived through traumatic things uh, yeah. in our lives. How do you, how do you begin to process through something that's traumatic and, 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 and really change it into something that maybe, like you said, maybe is, turns into life affirming. Yeah. Yeah. I think gradually, right. So it's not something you do straight away for most of us in the beginning, we're just kind of trying to survive and like figure out how to get our equilibrium back. Um, but then later, just even knowing that post-traumatic growth is possible, I think is helpful, right? Because most of us are familiar with post-traumatic stress. And, you know, it used to be that we thought that after some sort of a traumatic event, which by the way, is completely subjective um, to the person. So it's not like some events are traumatic universally and others aren't. So it's not just, you know, death of a, a partner or a spouse. It can be lots of different things that happen to us in life and we we perceive them as traumatic but it used to be you know the idea was that the goal was just to get back to where you were right to bounce back to where you were and then post traumatic growth comes along in the 90s um and and tells us that no actually we can take any sort of life experience and we don't just have to bounce back to that baseline of where we were we can use it to bounce forward to the life that we want and and for a lot of us, what happens and what certainly happened for me is that you realize, oh, wow, life is shorter and more precarious and more precious than I thought. So am I living it the way that I want to live it, right? Am I am I being the kind of person that I want to be? Am I in alignment with the impact that I want my life to be about? And so post-traumatic growth is really just the opportunity to find that deeper connection, right? That deeper connection to your friends, to your family, to your, your spiritual you know, side, whatever that is for you, to your values, right? To living more intentionally so that you're not just on autopilot anymore. And a lot of us and me at 40, I was kind of on autopilot, right? And this snapped me out of that, gave me that opportunity. Yeah. And I think uh, I'm thinking back just even the last year and a half of what we've all lived through and mm -hmm. the idea that a lot of us, I think we're sort of like shaken awake of, well, I, I actually don't like these things in my life. I want to change yeah. my career. I don't want to go back into the office or yeah. I, now I love being with my kids or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. And so I think we're seeing all these like really big shifts uh, yeah. across the world of people just saying, whoa, wait a minute. So it's almost like we're all coming out of this post-traumatic place and mm -hmm. just trying to like find our way through the dark, it feels like. Yeah. And we have the ability to make those decisions for ourselves. We don't have to just keep repeating the same patterns, you know, over and over and over. We can, we can pause and say, what is it that I want? And that's what I did, right? I got to that place where I said, wait a minute, do I want to be in this career anymore? I don't know that I do. It's not, you know, it felt like a safe place to be. I'd been there for 10 years. The money was good. I loved the people, but it it wasn't really what my heart wanted to do. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I made a switch and it was a little scary and financially precarious in the beginning, but I'm super glad that I did it. You know, it's not for everyone to be a, a solopreneur, but I love it for me. And now I get to to do something that, you know, when I became a widow, there there wasn't the kind of coaching program that I provide. It wasn't available to people. It just didn't exist. Which and is so crazy. Right? How is that even possible? <laughs> well, I just I think as a culture, we're not so great at grief. I, I mean, I think we're making advances, but and life coaching, of course, is if you look at it in the last couple of years, is really just starting to starting to take off. We're at we're at the beginning of something that's I think pretty amazing. So 
Yeah. And I'm, I'm seeing a shift. I mean, I'm a huge advocate of mental health, of therapy, of doing whatever you need to do to, Mm -hmm. to make it through the day, to be the best version of you humanly possible. And I think that coaching now is, is something that we're okay talking about. Mm -hmm. It's, I feel like, I mean, maybe you could tell me a little bit better because you're in this world, but I feel like the stigma is, is, sort of coming off the table so that we're okay saying like, yeah, I go to therapy or mm-hmm. yeah, I have a life coach or whatever it might be. That That's no longer like a, a mark against you. Yeah, more and more so. I think sometimes it depends on where you live. You know, I'm from Kansas and I remember uh, it took me a while to come out <laughs> because, yeah. you know, I don't know, we're just I guess more conservative area typically. And kind of thought of life coaching as some sort of snake oil salesman. I don't know. Um, right. So maybe depending on your exposure to it and how, you know, your comfort level with it, some people are, are very out and about and some people are still a little hesitant and that's okay. That's the natural progression of, of anything new, but I'm with you, you know, mental health is, it is the one resource that, you know, if we don't have that, we've got nothing, nothing else. Right. And so I personally am just very interested in making sure that, I'm taking good care of myself and that's what allows me to take good care of my kids. And that's what allows me to make the impact on the world that I want to make. And, you know, it's all connected. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. It's Tuesday, and that means we have another Ask Shauna, and this one comes from Tamara. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Tamara says, Hi, Shauna. I'm hoping you can help me out. I have a couple of questions about budgeting. I run my budget through an Excel spreadsheet that I work on at least every payday bi weekly. I own my own home, and all my bills that are coming out are out of my sole income. I have a stable job, but I seem to worry about my monthly spending, even though I can track my expenditures and have them fairly stable. My first question is, how much money should I have as a buffer or cushion in my checking account? The second question is, when I want to put money aside for savings, when is the best time to do this? Most of my bills fall at the beginning of the month, but I never know when the best time is to move money around. 
Great question, Tamara. And I wish there was a clear cut answer for you. Much of this will depend on what makes you feel most comfy. And sometimes that takes trying a couple of different things to be like, okay, yeah, this is this is the place where I feel comfiest with my money. But I'm going to give you my two cents for what it's worth, my opinion, what I do, and hopefully you can use this as a little guidance. So for your buffer, I personally like to try to keep about 30 to 50% pad on my fixed expenses in my checking account. It doesn't work every single month. There are some months where I have to dip into that pad. But in general, that's that's a number that makes me feel comfy. So let's say that my fixed expenses, the stuff that I have to pay is $5,000 a month. I'm just picking this number out of air. I like to keep an extra $1,500 to $2,500 in my checking account as, as that pad. That's what what I have found works well for me and helps even out months when I have extra expenses like a car repair or we're traveling or just something comes up. But I would say find a number that makes you feel like you can sleep at night knowing it's there. And for all of us, that's going to be a different number. So the, again, this comes back to that trial and error of figuring out what is going to make you feel the comfiest. My only caution is that you don't keep too much in there. So some of us get in the habit of of keeping too much pad in our checking account. And it's not a bad thing. But the problem with too much of a pad is then that money isn't working for you. It isn't growing. It isn't invested in a high yield savings account, anything else. It's not growing in an upward momentum because you don't earn any interest in your checking account. There are some checking accounts where you do. However, generally speaking, you don't. So my only caution is to find a number that you feel comfortable with, but one that isn't isn't too big where that money is just sitting idle in your checking account. Your number two question, when is the best time to pull money for savings? Again, it's going to come back to your comfort level. I like to think of savings as a fixed expense. So in my mind, if I think of it as a fixed expense, I'm more likely to do it every month. It doesn't mean it happens every month. But if I put my mind around it, at least it gets me focused on the positive side of savings. And I like to move it over in little chunks. So if I wanted to save $1,000 a month, I would aim to move it either in two $500 chunks or $250 a week. I think sometimes your brain can freak out on you if you move the entire $1,000 all at once versus little bits here and there. So much of money is our mind, is how we think, act, and feel about money, is those panic button moments where even if we have the money, we move it over and suddenly we're freaked out that that amount of money is gone essentially from a bank account. It's not really gone. It's moved to our savings. But our mind just sees these numbers decreasing and it's like all of the the panic anxiety buttons about money go off in your head. So we're trying to just calm the mind a little bit. We're just trying to get the mind to go, it's okay, it's okay. So if we move little bits of money, we're kind of tricking ourselves into going, it's okay. So each week when $250 comes out, it's it's okay. It's not that big of a deal, right? So those are the little games that I play in my head that I think really work well for most of us. But if you spend more at the beginning of the month on just regular expenses, maybe you could aim to move savings in those like two weeks in the middle of the month. So you're not backing it up at the end of the month or at the beginning of the month. But again, play with it a little bit. See what uh, what feels right for you. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of guidance. If you're listening and you've got an Ask Shauna question, hit me up on the website, mmoneypodcast.com. Right on the homepage, you can submit your Ask Shauna or there's a link in the show notes. Again, these questions can be anonymous and there's no question that is a bad question. We all learn and grow, even I do, from answering your questions. So if you've got a question, I want to answer it. There is a lot more to our conversation, so let's jump back into it. So tell me a little bit about 
after the accident in 2016 till fast forward now to mm-hmm. 2021, what are what are some of the money lessons mm-hmm. or uh, you know, money aha moments that that you learned that you now infuse into other women who are in this scenario. Yeah. So personally, I went through my own kind of wealth purgatory where because there was a life insurance policy, which by the way was very messy because we didn't have it documented well. And so I actually had to work with my late husband's first wife um, because her name was still on some stuff that we didn't know about. And thank goodness she's an amazing human, um, and we figured that out together. <laughs> yeah. But we we really had never had a conversation before the accident. L- literally, never had a conversation. Wow. Uh, yeah. So um, you know that was that was a challenge, and then also just making sure that because it it really wasn't documented that his he had a, a son from that marriage. It wasn't his biological child, but you know he had always been Lance's dad since Lance was a, a little little boy. His biological father had left, and so you know I knew he wanted to take good care of him, but you know, his first wife and I had to work that out. So learned a lot about the value of documenting your wishes and making sure your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. And then just learned a lot about what it's like to have more money than you've really ever had before and still feel completely terrified (laughs) that you don't know what to do with it or you're going (laughs) to lose it or how to manage it or, you know, all of that. Um, which has positioned me very well to help other women with the same. I didn't really go through as much of, um, the resentment as I see a lot of widows go through. So sometimes, you know, they they'll have money and they'll resent that money because of what they make that money mean. Mm. Right. And they won't just have so many mixed feelings about it. It's like an opportunity to do things they've never done, but then they'll feel a tremendous amount of resentment or guilt using it. And so if we can just kind of detach, you know, and, and, and look at money as it's just, it's just paper is, you know, I mean, it's not even paper half the time, right? We're looking at electronic devices that tell us we have money, but there's no emotional component to it, right? Having a lot of money, having a little money, whatever amount of money you have, it doesn't mean anything about you. And if we can detach ourselves from the story of what we make that money mean, then we can start to actually make data-driven decisions about it instead of emotionally driven decisions. And that's where I find that people stumble. Right. How do you peel those layers back? I mean, is it is it about really digging into your beliefs, your values, yeah. the things you've been taught about money? Is it really going through that process? Yeah, I use I use something called the self coaching model or the thought model, and so basically, what I'm trying to look at is what are the what are the facts of your financial situation, and then what is the mental story about your situation? And I'll plug it into this tool called the model, and the model just teaches that the math, the data of life, the things that happen to us don't cause our feelings, right? Our stories do, our thoughts do. So it's our thoughts that create our feelings and our feelings that drive our actions and our actions that produce our results. And so thoughts really are the cause of our, of our relationship with money. You know, thoughts really give us security around money or insecurity around money. So I'm just always looking to help a, a widow understand what her stories are around the money And it's a lot like, you know, peeling back the layers of an onion to kind of find that story. Because when we have stories around money, we don't usually realize that they're stories. We think that we're just making observations about the facts and we're we're just in our stories, right? Right. And so an outsider like me can come in and point out and say, no, actually, you know, this idea that you don't deserve this money isn't true, right? It's not factual. It's just a story. This idea that you don't know how to manage money, that's not something you have to believe if it isn't serving you, right? This idea that it's blood money or, you know, whatever you're telling yourself about this money, it's not actually set in stone. You get to decide how you want to think about this money and and therefore you're in charge of your relationship with money. But if we don't have the awareness of that choice, we can't make a conscious one. And so that's my job as a coach. And how, how do people, so obviously we point this out, we, we have this awareness, but how do we then make that shift? If we, Mm -hmm. if we look at money through that lens, like, okay, now we understand this, this, we deserve the money. It's not blood money, whatever. We go through that whole Mm -hmm. process. How do we then practically 
make that shift? Is it just day in, day out work? Hmm. Sometimes it's like a light switch and it just kind of flips. And once you see it differently, you never go back to seeing it the way you used to see it. But oftentimes what I find is that I, you know, I just kind of have to keep helping people get curious enough and far enough away from their stories that they can see them as stories, right? So we're like poking Mm -hmm. holes in the stories and we're looking at what the stories are creating in their lives and really just kind of examining it to the point where the story becomes an object, right? If, If I can show someone that the story they have about money is just as much an object as, you know, their coffee cup, right? They can pick up the story or they can put it down, right? It's totally optional. And they can see the impact of that story and what it's going to create for their financial future. Then they can decide, okay, if it's optional, maybe I, maybe I want to put it down, but it really is an exercise in awareness to the point where someone sees the power in their own ability to choose their money story. I like that. I like the visualization of a coffee cup, like making it that simplistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and understanding that when you when you lift up a cup to drink a sip of coffee, you're making a choice to do that, and you can do that same thing with your money story. Totally, yeah, wow. and that that can be. I mean, it's it's amazing when it happens quickly, but it can be a lot of work because most of us didn't get these stories yesterday, right? We learned them from our families, we learned them growing up, and we've been on the planet for you know some decades now, and so it can be a challenge. Mm, yeah. So tell me a little bit about your podcast, The Widowed Mom Podcast, and kind of how all this came together, how the life coaching, the podcast, like how this really formed so that you you really started empowering other women to mm-hmm. have a positive experience. Yeah. So I went back to work after Hugo died, and my therapist was telling me what a great job I was doing, <laughs> and she said <laughs> I should be a therapist. And, and I was at the same time really trying to figure out, you know, I don't think I really want to stay in aviation because that's the industry I was in. And so she said, you should go to therapy school, go, go get an MFT degree and uh, you can come and work in my practice. And so that's kind of the path that I started down. And I actually enrolled or applied to a marriage and family therapy program. And at the same time, while I was, I had to wait um, for a semester before that program would start. And so while I was waiting, then I, at the same time had found a coach and a coaching program. And I don't think it would have been a bad career for me to be in, to be a therapist, but coaching was just so powerful for me that I went from, I want to be a therapist to maybe I'll be a coach on the side as I work through this therapy degree to, no, I think I don't want to be a therapist. I think I just want to be a coach. (laughs) Right. And that felt like the scariest thing because, you know, another two year degree and a, a fairly respected career path and one that you know that when you complete a degree, you're going to have a job offer. That would have been the safer path, path, right? So it really took a lot of um, digging deep and being honest with myself that what I really wanted was to pursue coaching. And so I abandoned the therapy school before it even started, got certified as a coach while I was working. And then as soon as I was certified, I quit my job and I went all in to coaching and it was terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, it was totally worth it. And so I, I'm, my progression was kind of first just working with women one-on-one. And then I got to the place where I was fully booked as a one-on-one coach and I couldn't accept any more clients. And I was also just seeing that, you know, we were having the same conversations over and over and over. And every woman I was working with was thinking that there was something wrong with her right? That her problems were unique. She was, you know, the special snowflake. And I just started seeing if I could get these women together and they could see that there is nothing wrong with them. This is just grief. This is just what it's like to be a widow and a mom, right? Then we could make progress so much faster. And so at that point I switched into working with women in groups. And now I run a group program for women who are widows and moms. And the age of their children is really irrelevant. I have moms that have itty bitty children. And then I have moms with, you know, grandkids sometimes um, and all over the country. Right. But I, I help them figure out how do I genuinely love my life again? How do I not settle for this new normal? And the podcast, of course, was part of that. Not everyone's going to pay to work with me, right? And I think podcasts are amazing. I'm, obviously, you do too, right? We can help so many people just by 
giving them the information that we have via a podcast. And so that's what I try to do with the widowed mom podcast is just make it, you know, something that feels not, not just inspirational, but actually is, is practical and tangible and something that someone can go to and, and really feel heard and understood and have things that they can implement that help them in their healing. Um, and right. even though it is for widowed moms, I often find people are listening to it that, that aren't widows, right? They just like, they're interested in grief. You know, maybe they've had some other significant loss and maybe it's a, a non-death loss, but they want to learn about grief or they want to support someone who's grieving and they want to learn about post-traumatic growth. And so I just, I'm, I get, you know, fired up and <laughs> really passionate about what I do. And, you know, I've been doing it now for several years and you know, making more money than I've ever made too, right? Making a bigger impact than I've ever made, but also better off financially than I've ever been. So. Which is interesting, right? You you followed your your intuition. You followed what felt right for you. And yeah. And it feels then, so aligned. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing when that happens. I, I wish for everyone listening that they have that experience. Yeah. And I just, that, I, I didn't have that before. Right. Yeah. So many of us don't. I mean, I think that I've had that in my life too. I think that's a story for a lot of us and it's tricky to figure out how do I get, how do I get out of this? Mm -hmm. and can I get out of it financially okay? And sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes you have to take that risk and that and that gamble and and it and it's scary, but uh a lot of times it does pay off. Yeah, great. I just decided, you know, I'd watched other coaches do it, not not working with the same women that I work with, but I just decided if other women can do it, I can do it. Right. Yeah. And, and I just decided I wasn't going to quit until I did it and I did it. And and that's how, that's how it has to be done, I think. But I also, you know, worked while I was in training and, you know, I, I, you I made, had it, a plan. made it work. Yeah. I yes. made it work. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, we've talked about so much grief, your your story, uh, this idea of wealth purgatory. And I want to leave everyone with just something to keep top of mind. What would you tell listeners who uh, maybe haven't been widowed, maybe they're just in a place of grief, but about this idea of, of wealth purgatory and really how to set themselves up so that they can really thrive? Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the main things that I would tell people is just to remember that money doesn't cause our feelings, right? The amount of money we have doesn't cause our emotional experience of money. It really is an optional story that we're telling ourselves. It's our thoughts and our beliefs about money that cause our feelings. And so if we could just remember that, right? And, and get to the bottom of what we're telling ourselves about money and clean that up, then we can have an amazingly positive experience about money, no matter how much money we have. That's not easy to do, but it's totally worth doing. Such good advice. Well, Krista, I would love for you to tell everyone listening where they can go to find out more about your life coaching and your podcast. Sure. Yeah. So the podcast is called The Widowed Mom Podcast. And, you know, on social, I'm different places. Uh, different things because <laughs> the names you want are never available. Right. So, right. On, <laughs> right. So on Facebook, I am coaching with Krista and it's K R I S T A, which is also my website, coaching with Krista.com. And on Instagram where I also hang out, I am at life coach Krista. My hope is that you never, ever, ever, ever experience what Krista and so many other people have been through when you're widowed. But I really hope that this episode can be a little motivation to have some of those money talks with your spouse or your partner, so you've got some things set up just in case. I love to do things just in case, particularly when it's money related. If you want to connect with Krista, you can check out her podcast. It's called The Widowed Mom Podcast, or head over to her website, coachingwithkrista.com. If you found value in this episode, please share it with your friends who you think would also enjoy this message. You can find links to Krista and the episode sponsors right in the show notes. And as I mentioned before, if you love this show and have a minute to spare, please head to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for the show. It would mean so much to me. I'll see you back here in a few days for another great episode. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go. 
We want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode.